My name is Neil Rockey. I'm a trial lawyer, and my nickname is the Rockweiler for my unique courtroom style. And I love cross examination. I love it so much that I started this podcast called the Killer Cross Examination Podcast. And week in and week out, I brought to you some of the very best trial lawyers in the country, so that you can hear their approaches to cross examination, their feelings about cross examination, and more. And this week is no exception. My guest is Joey Jackson. Millions know him from television, from court TV, from headline news, CNN, and more, where he is a legal analyst and commentator. Breaking down and explaining some of the biggest cases, including trials and criminal defense, true crime cases like Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry, Kyle Rittenhouse, Ahmed Aubrey, and more. Joey walked the country through the Jody Arias trial with Dr. Drew, Headline News After Dark, and more. But he's far more than just a television analyst. He's a fierce courtroom advocate strategist and cross-examiner not only does he talk the talk but he walks the walk during our podcast you'll see his style come to life you'll hear it in his voice the cadence in which he speaks you'll hear it you've got to see it for yourself i can't wait for you to meet joey jackson joey jackson welcome to the killer cross-examination podcast all right, so Joey Jackson, uh, welcome to the Killer Cross Examination Podcast. I'm a huge fan, huge fan. I can't believe it or not. I feel like I'm talking to like uh, like a rock star. <laughs> Far from a rock star, I I'm greatly appreciated, very flattered. You're doing wonderful work yourself, and it's wonderful to be with you. Well, I thank you for that. Okay, so I want to jump right into it. So I I love cross examination. I talk a ton about it. I talk a ton about uh, you know, the, the skill set, the lack of training that I see in some younger lawyers. Um, and so it, it, it became a, it seemed like a natural fit for me to have you on the show one, because you're an accomplished noted lawyer and you have this added layer in that you've seen so many prominent lawyers in trial. And so it seemed like it was really a great opportunity for me to kind of combine the, the media with the lawyer and have that chat with you. So thank you. Of course. Thank you. All right. So first of all, tell me a little bit about your career. Where did it start? How did you get going? When did you sort of first feel like the courtroom was, was your, was your domain, your place? Okay. So I will uh, sum it all up, Neil, and I'll be as brief as I can. Uh, so I, um, you know, I never really, I didn't grow up wanting to be a lawyer or anything else. Um, you know, my dad, may he rest in peace. He was a police officer and then he went to the fire department thereafter. I always looked up to him. He was a very positive influence and was always positive about it, anything. I remember in Little League, I'd strike out four times and he'd be like, but your swing was so good, you know? And I'd pitch and I'd walk the bases loaded and around and around. It was like five to nothing because of all the walks, but they're kind in Little League. Leave them in, leave them in. So my dad would be like, but your form, if you could just tweak it a little bit, you're going to be great. So he was always real positive, but we didn't really talk about me being a lawyer. My mom, you know, equally wonderful woman. Uh, thank God she's still around. She was a nurse. And, uh, you know, it was interesting because when I was in high school, I wasn't particularly a very good student. I was, you know, pretty average, if not below. And I kind of didn't really know what I wanted to do. And my mom was like, you're going to college. I'm like, I'm not going to college. I want to go on Broadway. I want to act or I want to do something else. She's like, yeah, okay, you're going to college. So we went on a trip to SUNY Brockport, State University of New York. Uh, you know, here in New York, we have this wonderful state system. And so I went to school there. And I met a mentor who was part of my firm now, quite frankly, he serves as our counsel emer emeritus. Um, and he happened to be a lawyer and uh, he was a ter terrific human being. And he just sort of assisted me and helped me and kind of got me focused in life because <laughs> I was all over the place. You know, I show up to school as a 17 year old, my birthday's in September. So it's, uh, you know, I went to school at 17, I became 18. 
And I just started working with him and I kind of developed the interest. And there was so many things, Neil, that I was terrible at. Uh, math, science, blood, all of that stuff was bad. But I could always put together a decent argument. You know, I, was, I wrote relatively well. And so I just got involved in, in uh, college and decided to really focus and give myself an opportunity and to work hard. And then even after college, where I was student body president and I was involved in the Legal Information Service, which was a student-oriented kind of uh, organization, and after that, I went to graduate school. I got a master's in public administration, and that was cool because I wanted to be in politics maybe. You know, you're young, you have a lot of interest. And then from the master's in public administration, I was working for the New York State Legislature at the time. I said, you know, I, I should do this law thing. And so I went and I decided to do law school because it was one of the few things that I thought that I can decently do and that I was passionate about. And uh, so the journey began, and that's what happened. So when, when did you... Uh, when did you like, first set foot in a courtroom and when did you first get the, the bug? Because you have to have the bug. You have to, <laughs> so you know you have to like doing it, right? <laughs> you do. You do. I, I always talk, to, you know, when I have the, the pleasure and privilege of speaking to young people, I say you have to do what you're passionate about. You have to find that thing that's going to wake you up every day, your internal pilot light that's going to motivate you to be the best of you every day. And when I found that, you know, I could argue with people and get paid for it, that was really good with me. When I found that I could do something that I thought, you know, that I could probably excel at, that was pretty good with me. And, you know, I just want to make clear to, to anyone who thinks they don't have the skill set or thinks that they have to be born a genius or who thinks that, you know, they have to be ready to be a lawyer when they're two years old. Uh, that's not the case. Um, again, I was, I was average at everything, if not below average, uh, you know, as a student and everything else. And I had no particular interest in law. I had no particular interest in anything until I found something that I really wanted to do. And I, then I did get the bug and say, you know what, I, I could probably do this. And part of what we do, as you know, Neil, is believing that you can do it, right? And so I would say that having met my uh, mentor when I was in college and having attended and interned with him during the summers and having gone with him to court, I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. You get to dress nicely, you get to protect people and you get to help people in their life. And so the first time I ever stepped foot in a courtroom, I was in college and I saw in my summer experience what that would be like. And then subsequent to that, I mean, before that, I'd never met a lawyer. Um, I didn't know what a no lawyer looked like. I didn't, I, you know, it was, it was great. I was born and raised in the Bronx, which was great. You know, great neighbors, great friends, great people. Um, but I wasn't particularly good at anything, as I mentioned. And it's something I just developed. And so in co college, I had that experience uh, being in a courtroom. And I would not be in an actual courtroom thereafter. Uh, until actually law school, when I started competing and being on the moot court team and national trial team. And that's when, by the time I got to law school, it was over. I was going to do this for a living. I was going to be the best at it. I was going to work as hard as I needed to. And I was going to, you know, do what I had to do to, to protect and defend the interests of, of other people. So that's what happened. So I'm sure, I'm sure there are many people that are interested in hearing how your career sort of moved from law school and those those practical applications where you're doing moot court, which is really for those that are listening, arguing appellate cases, basically, at least that's how we ours was. Yeah. And then yours was actually something that sounds like even more advanced. You had a, another opportunity, which was basically trial skills or a trial team, yeah. which is probably more like more like trials. Um, how did it evolve into you know, work us through your career arc, which is clearly still on the rise from there uh, up until till now. So we're trying to be on the rise. Every day is a challenge, as you know, <laughs> but we're trying to make it happen. Well, you know, that, yeah, I think you're being humble. Um, <laughs> you, you look, let, let, let's be frank. You've you've found a way to merge. Um, you've obviously got a successful law firm and practice that covers with some very talented lawyers who work in your firm. I'm familiar with with several of them, and you yourself are. Have, I've, I've seen some cases that you guys have um, have handled. Uh, apart from all the television media stuff, where you've made some real significant, gotten some very significant results in some very big cases, and then obviously you've helped the public in an added role, which is to identify and talk about legal issues 
pressing legal issues, and you've been able to sort of help the public digest those in pieces that make those not the legalese that we hear, but the put it into a way that we can appreciate. And so, yeah, your career is clearly on the rise. I appreciate the the humility, but <laughs> but it is. I'm, so. I'm I'm grateful for that, Neil. You know, it's it's interesting because as you go throughout life, you meet different people and. You know, that's why I try to the extent possible to, to work with and help out other people because I had so much help right on the way. And I think part of that is attitudinal, right? If, if I think people who, people genuinely, in my point of view in, in the world, I think want to be helpful. And if you have the proper attitude and approach toward them, they will be helpful. And so I got a lot of help from so many different sources and so many different people who didn't have to. Um, and I'll always appreciate that. And I always will credit that, you know, from my family, my parents, you know, to my professors. And I could remember being in law school, you know, and I'll go back and then I'll, I'll fast forward. But I could remember my professors in law school basically saying, listen, you know, you, you can do this. And so as it related to the trial team, I could remember one professor in particular, Professor Kessler, he's, he's not with us anymore. But he always said that I had the ability to communicate. And the first case that I did with him, you know, he said to me, he said, hmm, you know, you have a very nice ability to communicate, but I hate what you're saying. <laughs> so he really worked with me in terms of storytelling, in terms of being logical, being relatable, telling something from beginning to middle to end, being persuasive. And so you work with people who help you. And then when we did these competitions, a lot of work, right, to, to tell a story. Story. And my, my view of the world is if a lawyer can tell a story, if you could connect with the jury, if you could minimize facts that are adverse, that is that they hurt your client, and you could, you, you can't ignore the elephant in the room, but you could certainly put those facts together with facts that are helpful to you when you maximize those facts, you can do really well. And that's where I learned it in law school. Look, this is a fact we can't ignore the elephant in the room. This is gonna hurt your client, but let's find a way to strategically deal with it and explain to the jury that it matters, but it doesn't matter as much as these five things, ladies and gentlemen, that I really want you to focus on. And so when we did those competitions, I thought that was helpful. Uh, the trial stuff, learning how to do a direct examination. You mentioned, Neil, the cross-examination. I became fascinated with cross-examination at that time. And, and the moot court stuff, the appellate stuff was a different skill set because you're not arguing in front of a jury, you're arguing to judges, right? So there's a different type of approach for judges. Um, and so that was helpful. And then after law school, I ended up becoming a prosecutor at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And I was one of those prosecutors where I just wanted to try cases, right? I asked my colleagues, you have a case? Can I try your case? Can I do this case? And I'll never forget, I tried a case in front of one judge and tr tremendous human being. His name was Judge Mogulescu. Judge Mogulescu, if you're listening out there, I hope you're doing really well. He's retired now. But my very first trial, and it was a significant trial, was actually against a football player who was in New York and he had harmed someone and I won't get into the devilish details, but he hurt someone pretty significantly at a bar. He was celebrating because he came to New York after signing a multi-million dollar contract. And so his attorney uh, was the rudest person I've ever met in the world. He had no humility. He was just terrible to me. And you know, I, I always could hold my own, right? I was fresh out of the game. I was a rookie prosecutor, but I had done the trial technique stuff. I had you know, not honed my craft, but I was well on my way. And I tried the case. His attorney was like, ah, you're gonna lose. You should just give me an offer now. Just forget it, you're terrible. You can't even put together a set. He was the worst. And then we went on trial and I was like, wow, this is what it is to be a lawyer for 10 years. This guy's got no game at all. Right, right, um, right. So it was nice to, to, to you know, prevail in that case, but it was even nicer for Judge Mogulescu to invite me to his office afterwards to say, look, these are the 15 things that you did wrong. And these are the three things you did right. Let's focus on that. And so when I talk about the help I had, I mean it, you know? So I, I, tr I tried that case. It was the first case I tried and it was a significant case. And he helped me. He didn't have to invite me to his chambers and just spend two hours with me saying, this is how you get better. And I'll never forget, just fast forwarding a little bit, when I became a second and third year prosecutor and I was trying a more significant felony in Supreme Court, I had another judge, his name was Judge Stackhouse, and he invited me to, to his chambers after that felony trial, also a conviction, and said, look, you know, now it wasn't the 15 things I did 
I did wrong. It was these are the 10 things you did wrong and not the three things I did right, but these are the five things you did right. And so eventually in the course of trying cases, it equalized and I started doing, you know, five things wrong and six things right. And, you know, four things wrong and seven things right. And so all the help that you have around you, I think really helps to develop you because, you know, we're all just a work in progress. We're trying to grow every day. We're trying to be the best we can be every day. And I credit, you know, that and my bureau chiefs and the other prosecutors I work with who would literally my office mates, you know, when it was trial time, we would work with each other. I would help them with their cases. They would help me with mine. And you sit through a lot of it and you take skills of, of others that you value and you do, you know, disregard others you don't. And eventually it, it just makes you a, a better lawyer and, and a better person. And so that's how it happened. So that's a, were you a naturally outgoing person were you someone that felt comfortable on the the not just the media stage but the actual stage and being judged or were you more would you put yourself more at the end of the spectrum where this was a challenge for you and you certainly had to keep kind of pushing yourself but once you got there you or you still maybe battling some shyness or where do you put yourself on that spectrum so it's, it's a great question and most people would be shocked to know that I was a very shy kid, right? As I was younger, I was very shy. Um, didn't like, and still don't like the spotlight, still don't like attention, still don't like, you know, coming through the back door, sneaking to my office. Um, you know, uh, so I was, and then I just sort of got out of my shell a little, a little bit more, a little bit more, we work at it. And the law was a pretty uncomfortable thing. And I think if we're gonna elevate to things that we can really succeed at. We have to challenge ourselves. We have to put ourselves in uncomfortable positions and we have to work through it. And again, I say to anybody who's like, ah, oh, you know, you, you gotta be a genius. So you gotta be at the top, but you have to be the first in your class. None of that's so. You just have to keep working and working and working. And so eventually, you know, law school, you know, the whole thing, getting there was a challenge. Taking the law school admissions exam was a challenge. The reading of law school was a challenge. Everything was. But eventually, I think what happens, and I'll button up your question this way, you know, law school, as you know, Neil, is the Socratic method, right? They just ask you questions. Mr. Jackson, what do you think? And I think they embarrass you so much uh, for three years that when you get out, you're like, I've been embarrassed. I've been mortified. I've been shot down. I've been told I was wrong. I've been told this. I've been told that. I don't care what anyone tells me. I'm going to come out of my shell and I'm going to do the best I can. And that's really the process of how lawyers are really, you know, not born, but lawyers are made because you go through this right. process where, you know, the professors come at you and they challenge you when you're, you're minimized and you're humiliated and all of that. And it kind of molds you into just being the best version of yourself. You, you, and you know why I asked the question, because there's this perception out there that we are, those of us that try cases are also naturally outgoing. We're naturally, we, we, we are naturally confrontational or naturally, and, and I, I have found, believe it or not, that many of our peers who are really good at this are, are not. That That's many right. of us are, are still in a lot of way part of the practice of law or media appearances or whatever, our, our ability to still challenge ourselves from the, the kid that walked in the room at fifth grade and was like, wait, how does everybody know each other? <laughs> and why am I? You know, yeah. why, why am I my all alone my, by myself? Great so, point. okay, so here's my question. So I want to, I'm a real advocate of cross-examination and I, I'm asking um, you sort of, tell me about your style as a courtroom lawyer and as a cross-examiner. How would you describe it? So, you know, it's, there's a saying that prosecutors cannot cross and defense attorneys can't direct, right? So for those uninitiated about the law, direct examination, of course, is what were the lighting conditions, what were the weather conditions, 
you know, where did you wake up? What did you do? Describe their clothing. What happened next? So a direct examination is generally what we do as prosecutors in order to elicit information and to establish the story. Introducing exhibits, do you recognize this? Is this a fair and accurate representation of the picture as it appeared, of the diagram as it appeared, as the document as you reviewed it, of the knife as you found it? Uh, you know, but as a prosecutor, you don't really have opportunities to cross because the defense, as we know, has no burden. Oftentimes, they don't even put on a case. And so you don't get good at it. But the interesting thing about that, and I think, you know, we are uh, kinship in that regard is because I was always fascinated by cross-examination, even though I didn't know what it was. And as a prosecutor, when I would invite witnesses to my office, I would not direct them. I would cross-examine them, right? And that is, I would poke mm. holes in their story, right? And so I would immediately get to the issue of, sir, you indicate, right, that you saw person X do this, you said that, right? But it's fair to say you gave a statement to the police and that was at the time that this occurred, right? And here we are seven months later, correct? And you, it, you'd agree with me that your memory was better at the time than it would be now, is that right? And it's fair to say that in that report, you meant to be accurate. And so I won't go, go through the whole machination, but I learned aberrationally, I say that because normally prosecutors, you invite someone to the office, Okay, what happened? Where were they? What was the clothing? What was the weather? What, and then and usually, I, the, and when they'll bring somebody else in, another member of the office, yes, to cross-examine, yes, and say, "Well, no, 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 no," or "You got to clean that up," or "This yeah. is an area we're concerned about." That's a really fascinating approach, Joey, for yes. um, a prosecutor. Uh, I mean, I haven't been in—I haven't been in the internal offices of a prosecutor's office, watching them put together a case for some time. But when I was that's that is not how any anybody i knew did it right i just i just became fascinated with you know i a search for the truth right they call cross a search for the truth so when i'd invite all the witnesses to my office i'd spend all day and when i say all day you have multiple cases right i'm not talking to one witness all day and every witness in my office i would immediately go to it and i'd look for the inconsistencies and i'd hide behind look this is what the other side's going to do to you so i'm just you know if, if you could withstand this you could withstand anything and i found that i got so much better at it to the point that you know when i did switch sides um, and even before that, because as a prosecutor, I could recall cross-examining defendants in cases. And I remember one case in particular, my office mates helped me. And this defendant, um, and not to get into the weeds, but he had testified in the grand jury. As we know, a grand jury is proceeding in New York, 23 members, a majority has to vote out an indictment. An indictment is not guilt. An indictment is reason to believe a crime was committed and the defendant committed it and it gets the case to trial. But in any event, he went to the grand jury and told the story in the grand jury. And at trial, his story was completely different. And here I am, I'm the guy, as I mentioned, who's crossing all my witnesses who come to my office. And I had a field day with this guy. In fact, Neil, his story in the grand jury was so different that his story at trial that I promise you, I thought I read the, the wrong transcript. I was sitting there, I was, I was sitting there in a cold sweat in front of the jury saying, did I pull the wrong, is this the wrong case? Like I couldn't believe it. Everything he said was different to where he was. He was inside, he was outside. It was day, it was night. You know, he was young, it was old. And so I said, sir, you testified in the grand jury, did you not, right? And you were told before giving your testimony that you'd be put under oath, correct? And you were under oath, right? And you knew you wanted to be truthful at that time, correct? Because you wanted to relate your story to the grand jury, right? And you'd have no basis or reason to lie, would you? No. So would it be fair to say, and I, and I just went at him, that... On the day in the grand jury, sir, you indicated that the event happened, and when it did, you were inside of the deli. You said that, didn't you? Uh, well, no, I think I was. I'm sorry, sir. Let me ask you again. Do you recall saying? Did you? Do you remember being asked this question and giving this answer? That's not what you told this jury. And I just went, and so I I could remember, like it was yesterday. So I had the grand jury transcript, and eventually I put the grand jury transcript on the desk. And because I was hitting him with these inconsistencies and it got to the point where I said to him, wouldn't it be fair to say you told the grand jury, well, I don't remember that. And then I would literally reach over, <laughs> yeah. to grab the testimony and he'd say, oh, well, wait, wait, no. I, I. So it was an easy conviction, but I just became fascinated with the whole I issue. Love it. So when I became a defense attorney with respect to the police and, you know, most of the cross examinations with them, you know, it, I just got a little bit more proficient. Added. And again, so we're all what I love is that 
I can just tell the passion that you have in in even just now relating that story and the the juices get flowing don't they when you feel like you've got someone who's like you know i'm gonna cut you again and again and you get to a point where you almost feel like if you're a boxing aficionado or a boxing fan you know the sweet science remember there came a point where larry holmes was punching muhammad ali and i think he was he was just beating him up i mean ali was just the greatest ever but just you know you you, you can't be the greatest ever and the greatest into your forties and fifties in the ring right. and he's punching him. And at one back, look back at the referee. Like, do you want, I need to keep punching him. <laughs> you know what I mean, you want me to, I, I got to keep hitting him for you to, right. For you to, to throw in the, the towel. So I get the sense. So I I'm a fast talk. So I, when I was growing up, um, my grandfather used to always, challenge me slow down slow down but i'm a fast talk mm -hmm. i eat fast and i talk fast and i really can't explain why i eat fast but um so do you talk at that cadence when you're questioning a witness do you get to a point where you are just where you are going at that speed because i know if i were on the receiving end of that cross-examination my goal would be to try to slow it down and your goal would be to try to continue at that pace to basically make me, I'd be making mistakes and I would feel like I would start to lean back and you would probably lean in, right? I mean, is that, do you use that pace and that, that speed? So I, the answer is yes. And a lot of times it's not even controllable because when you get into the mix and you get into the arena, you can hardly, you know, help yourself. And so oftentimes, and I'll freely admit, Core reporters are like, I'm sorry, <laughs> can you slow down? Because yeah. right, they're taking down every single thing. And judges are like, Mr. Jackson, I get it. But, you know, can we just go one thing at a time? Yeah. And so I, I do get, you know, admonished uh, by the court and by the court reporter. Like, I, I know you want to go in on this guy, but, you know, give him a chance. And I think, but, you know, I think that a lot of cross is pressing a witness. You want to press them. You don't want to let them off the hook. You want them to know that you're not the guy to be messed with. And it's interesting because I've, you know, speaking of cross, it's as it's one of my favorite things to do. I'm not as a shameless plug, but I do some stuff for Lawline, which does continuing legal education for lawyers. And I have a course that I put on Lawline. I think it's 90 minute course, whatever. And it's called Killer Cross Examination. And I delineate, you know, giving real life examples from cases of different cross examinations that I've, you know, have conducted it in the, in the past. But yes, the answer is, is that I just press and I press and judges are like, well, wait a second, slow down, buddy. And that's the way it works. So I, so I, I, I love it because I tend to be, my pace is quick too. So I, and I, I have tried at times to vary my pace. Um, there are some moments where I've been, where I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm using pace and I'm using speed and I'm um, leaning in. And then there are moments where the witness is pausing and you really just want to almost emphasize the pause, sometimes even in a transcript from an, a, a, a preliminary hearing. Mm -hmm. And if it gets too long, I know the court reporter is not typing in one, two, three, four. The, I'm like, sir, it's been about 30 seconds and you haven't answered the question. We'll give you as much time as you want, but you having, you know, are you struggling there? Because I wanted to be clear that there was at some point a, and then you can see the witness start to really, really sweat. So that's beautiful. Yeah. So so let me ask you this. So um, your favorite part of a trial. So we know, and and you're going to explain this, I'm sure, really well. But we've got you know voir dire, which the jury was the general public almost never sees. If you're from the south, it's called voir dire. Right. Uh, it sounds better when you say it in a southern tone like that. Um, but we almost never see that because we never really get to see it. There's a little bit going on now with, uh, I think it was one of the cases, was it Marquis Floyd? We saw some of some, I think we saw some jury selection without seeing the jurors. Um, but we don't get to see that very much. Then there's opening, obviously, direct, cross, closing. What's your favorite part of a, of a trial? So... To me, there's there's nothing better than cross examination because I think that's where cases are won or lost. Uh, you know, anyone could say anything, but 
when you're challenged as to your observations, you're challenged as to your prior statement, you're challenged as to other things in your background that may give a jury pause to believe you, I think that that's the crux of a trial. And so, you know, to me, there's nothing like being able to get up and to cross-examine a witness. And there's nothing like really the strategic moves that you have to make. And for me with cross, and I was joking the other day with, you know, one of, one of the younger lawyers uh, in my office, the, the interesting thing is whenever I do a cross, I prepare for, you know, and this is what lawyers always have to do. You want to prepare for if the, if the witness goes left, you, what you're going to do. If the witness goes right, what you're going to do. And I'm so used to witnesses going left and going right. I was relating a case that I'll never forget. It, this was in Nassau County, Long Island. And I, it was a case involving a, a client that had shot and fired a gun and threw it in his trunk and the police came and everything else. And, you know, we were at a, we were at a, uh, a search hearing, right? We were at, you know, how you have these map hearings with respect to the propriety of the search, whether the search is good or not, right? Map versus Ohio, by the way, mm -hmm. for everyone listening. And so you want to always challenge whether the search is proper. And I had, you know, I said, the cop can't say this. So he's going to, and when he answered me, Truthfully, I almost, I, I was the one that paused. You remember before, <laughs> Neil, you were like, wait, it's been 30 seconds. You haven't said anything. I was like, he told the truth, right? Um, so, <laughs> you know. Did you look around like that? Like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what, what, wait a minute. You aren't <laughs> supposed to tell the truth. And so, you know, it was a suppression hearing where, thank goodness, the gun was thrown out because the officers were very truthful with respect to the search was bad. But so for me, you know, the, the preparation of the cross-examination, the looking at prior exhibits, the believing that they'll go left, they go right, and what's going to be my strategy if they do. So I think that and the closing argument where you can bring everything together is very important to me. And those are by far my two favorite things. I mean, voir dire, as you say, voir dire, voir it's dire. good to get to know the jury. It's right. good to kind of, you know, introduce them and condition them to what you're going to try to argue. It's all, always nice. But I think crossing and closing are my two favorites of all time in trials. Okay. What is your favorite type of witness to question? So we, and I know you're, there are civil cases and criminal cases, just, you know, let's, what's your favorite? I think there, there are really two. I, 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 like, uh, I like arrogant witnesses uh, because then you could really tee off on them. And, you know, it's interesting because an attorney who used to work with me, he, he doesn't uh, work here anymore, <laughs> but, you know, I, I had hired him because we had, had some cases together and we really went at it. It was it was a fabulous relationship we developed of respect for one another. And he used to call me the savage, the savage cross examination defense attorney. He was like, "You're a savage." And you know, it, it was interesting because you can't get away with that with everyone. I like to cross examine experts because they know everything. They know it all. And so with an expert, you could dismantle them with respect to other opinions, right? So it's fair to say that that's your view. Is that right? But there are others who would disagree with that. Would we agree? What do you mean? Well, why don't we talk about uh, Mr. X or Dr. X? That, that's someone who's preeminent in your profession. Would, would you agree with that? And that's someone who's well-respected. And that's someone who has, like you, a series of books. And to be fair to say, sir, that the premises that you rely upon would be inconsistent with that witness's point. Well, that's his point of view. Exactly. Just like this is <laughs> right. your point of view. We could agree. So experts you can go after because they're, you know, I, I don't mean to be overly broad or stereotypical, but they're arrogant and they know everything in the world and they're here to tell you. And usually, you know, they'll prepare a report and that report you have your expert look at and they'll tell you about the different things. So I think expert witnesses to go after them is a, is a work of beauty. And I also like to go after, you know, uh, usually police, but at the higher levels, um, you know, the higher, like the sergeants, the captains, the whatever, because they usually direct people and tell people what to do, but they don't do anything themselves. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm being a little brutal. Like I said, my dad was a police officer. No, you so should <laughs> lay it out. I, so, you know, yeah. so, so you have, you've also watched lawyers um, in cases that you've covered as a, as a legal analyst. Yes. And I know that you're a legal, you've done uh, what H, I think a headline news. I know you've done CNN. Um, I don't know you with that. Who are you with now? 
So I, um, I'm contracted to uh, CNN. Um, that's my home, my CNN and HLN, same network, uh, you know, Turner Broadcasting. Uh, you know, prior to that, I did Fox and, and MSNBC and all the rest of it. Uh, and I'm also a contributor for Dr. Oz, uh, who has a wonderful staff, uh, et cetera. And all that was an accident, but I could talk about that later. Um, so, yeah. I, I, I asked you, because in those roles, you're, you're, co you're, you, you're covering, watching, describing, breaking down trials. Yes. So have you ever watched lawyers in those cases that you covered and thought to yourself? Yes. Yeah. Say it, do it, stand up, object, sit down, you know, and, and when you get those moments, I'm not looking to call any lawyers out, but when you get those moments, how do you, you know, kind of like bite your knuckles and, and bite your tongue? So I'll say this, I um, have had occasion to see some very talented lawyers uh, who, you know, I, I admire very much in terms of how they go about their craft. Uh, I could, although controversial, and I know the Cosby case has since been, uh, you know, appealed and over overturned, but Tom Mesero was fascinating. Uh, his cross-examination was fascinating. His courtroom presence, fascinating. Uh, so you get to see those lawyers uh, who you just are like, wow, they have, they've got some skills. They got, they got game, so to speak, right? You hearken back to- And he and I have uh, talked on this, he and I have talked on this podcast about his- um, his cases and his approach and his, he's a very unique um, individual, really a fascinating person to talk to. And he has some really, um, he has some, some of the things that he has said at times, he's like, look, sometimes you got to ask an open-ended question. And I said, well, you asked the question, why in, in the Jackson case? And why did you ask that? And he said, because sometimes if you want to hit a home run, you got to you got to swing for the fence. That's right. Sometimes you're going to strike out. Sometimes you got to swing for the fences. Um, totally I, agree. I was so, so we know about guys like him, obviously. What about the cases that you've covered where there are lawyers who are not of that, that status uh, or even lawyers of that status. And you look and you think, cause you're standing back and you, and you see something, how do you approach it? What, what goes through your mind when you see something that's not done the way that you think it should be done? If yeah. anything, sure. No, so I, I, I'll tell you what my approach is. So, you know, look, no one has a monopoly on wisdom, obviously, Neil, and all of us attorneys do things differently. And I never want to prejudge anybody's strategy or how they do it. Um, you know, whether I could do a better or worse or what have you. But, you know, what I do just for my own sanity and peace of mind is I'll go through as we're watching the trials, what would be my cross examination, right? It makes me a better analyst, right? Because they're going to come to me and say, hey, were all the bases covered? What point was particularly effective? What was what didn't work? And so I'll go through with the witness as I'm watching it in the studio, right? Waiting for the trial to unfold. So I'll always like to go through the paces so that I'm actually there, right? It's sort of like I'm doing my own virtual cross examination, right? And, you know, and some, uh, again, are very proficient and some will do things a different way or some will ask questions that maybe I wouldn't have asked in that way, um, you know, and, and some would have asked questions that, wow, they really knocked it out the park and, you know, they did a great job. I couldn't have done any better, um, you know, and there are some who, you know, may, maybe are not as proficient and it, it would be a little bit more frustrating, but you just go through the process, I think, because at the end of the day, when you're analyzing and assessing the case, you want to analyze hey, what did they get out of this witness? Did they get it out effectively? Did this witness hurt them? Did they ask one question too many? Would you have approached it that way? Was there an exhibit they could have shown the witness? Was there impeachment material with respect to prior inconsistent statements in a report that they could have shown the witness? And so, yeah, uh, yes, when witnesses do it well, it's a work of art. Like the Matt Mesero thing hung, hanging on every word, like, wow. You know, the Johnny Cochran back in the day, you know, when I was, uh, I guess that was, uh, I just had gotten admitted back then. But the bottom line is like, wow, fascinating. And then there are some others that, you know, is a little bit more frustrating, sure. Okay, so um, I love to get perspective. You've given us some lawyering moments, some lawyers that you've watched. So if you don't mind, share with me, it just seems like a natural point, um, some of your favorite luring moments for you, the moments that you've had when you've been cross-examining a witness or you've been in court 
and something you've shared one with us where you were like the police officer was truthful and it caught you by surprise. That's not a generalization, just in that one particular right. case. But, you know, some gotcha moments where you, you know, the can't handle the truth type moment. So yeah. have you had any of those? Yeah, I um. <clears throat> so one of the uh, what comes to mind is a case and, and there's a lot of different cases over the years. But what comes to mind is a case I never forget. Uh, a gentleman who I represented who was accused of attempted murder some time ago. And he came to me and he was crying saying, I didn't do it. I promise. I swear. But a lot of people say they didn't do it. And there were four witnesses who said he did do it. And they happened to have a knife and it had DNA of the victim. So that, and it was recovered from his pocket. So it's, I mean, I know I'm his lawyer, but I was kind of skeptical. And I said, look, we can cut a deal and we can do this. And he's like, no deal. I so, you know, it's interesting and it taught me so many valuable things in my career. And that is that we can't prejudge everything and that we have to review and evaluate every shred of evidence. And as I went through the evidence, I noticed something very strange. And that was that the four witnesses who indicated that he did it were all known to each other. And it was a nightclub and there's gotta be 300 people at this club. And these are the four people who were the only witnesses for the prosecution who say it was him. Hmm, that's strange. And they're the three who, they all came together, um, thought it was weird. Not an independent bartender, not a security guard, not a patron, not anybody, just these three. So that was kind of fascinating. And then people who go to nightclubs usually drink. And so the more I kind of ferreted it out and ferreted it out, the more I saw that they were full of it. And so when I got to cross-examine them, we got admissions, yes, I was drinking and an admission from another. Well, I didn't see it, but my friend saw it. And then the other person who was stabbed, who in trial said he did it, I looked at his medical records. And in the medical records, they ask you, you know, what happened to you? What's your chief complaint of pain? What, what went on right before he went unconscious? And he's like, I don't know, someone stabbed me from behind, I couldn't see him, but at trial, hey, your guy did it. So I got, had the medical records and I was able to hit him with that. And so the witnesses were neutralized, but then we pivot to the issue of, well, how you explain the DNA on the knife? And a lot of people don't know, Neil, that you know DNA is very, very powerful. Yes, of course, but it has its limitations. It can't tell you how something got there, nor can it tell you when it got there, right? It can tell you it's your DNA, but not how it got there. And what was interesting when I looked at the case file and started getting into it, there were 12 police officers at the scene. The officer who pat frisked my client and took the knife was the same officer who assisted the bloody victim onto the stretcher and into the ambulance when he first arrived. And after assisting the bloody victim onto the ambulance, right, into the stretcher and the ambulance, he comes and searches my client. So we have a contamination issue. And you know, with respect to that trial, in the aha moments of cross-examining witnesses, is particularly the one who said he was stabbed, saying, you know, by the way, before you went unconscious, you remember talking the doctors, right? And you talked to some nurses too, and you told them what you knew. And would it be fair to say, sir, that in telling them that you indicated you didn't know what happened to you? You said that, didn't you? Well, I said it then, but, but after my friend told, oh, so your friend told you what happened. You didn't see it happen. So that was pretty significant. And then the other ones, well, I was drinking. And, and then of course, with the cop who did the pat frisk, what you want to do, and, and you know this, Neil, is you draw them in. You're great at what you do, right? Yes. Uh, you're a fabulous officer, aren't you? And you've served the force with distinction, right? And when you got to that scene, you were worried about one thing and one thing only. Well, what's that? The preservation of someone else's life, right? Yep, because that's what you do, right? And so although the victim was bleeding, you didn't think twice before you went to a system, did you? No, of course not. And that's because you wanted to save their life, right? And you jumped into action immediately. Of course I did. And you, you even not worrying about yourself, you touched them immediately, didn't I? I sure did. And you helped them onto the stretcher, absolutely. And there was blood all over the place. I didn't care, right? And then after that, you walked over and you saw my client. Yeah, I saw him. And he was standing there, right? Right. And you wanted to find who was responsible, right? So you, at that point, Pat frisked him and got the knife, correct? Yes. And you opened it and examined it. You did that, right? Yes. And that's how you thought it was him. Yes. And so without unwittingly, he walked right into the trap of he contaminated the knife. At the end of the day, he's found not guilty. It taught me an amazing lesson. I don't care if there are five witnesses that say this guy did it and there's DNA everywhere. Unless you evaluate that case file and look and search and see, you're not going to establish your case, um, you know. And so I just thought that that was a really telling moment for me. And it really kind of changed how I approached my strategy and everything else. It's a fantastic example. It really is. And I love how you drew them in. So the beginning part of that cross, 
deals a lot with logic. And the logic is, is that the, the police officer witness is going to logically, right, 99 out of 100, maybe nine, 999 out of, a, out of 1,000 officers or witnesses when given the chance to, you did it by the book, you're a hero, you did it the correct way. Of course, that was, of course, they're going to lead to that. Why wouldn't they lead to that? Right there, that and and soon after that, you've got him in that he's going. And I, when I try to think about these things, I think you know, witnesses, you, you want witnesses to latch on to. We're focused on words and concepts, right? And oftentimes, witnesses get get confused about words and concepts. When you're saying you would do any, you love Joey. He, he's your son. He's your pride and joy. You love him. You would do anything for him. You would do anything for him if he were struggling or if he were in trouble. And most people, a parent or a, you know, they're thinking, yes, yes, yes. Because they're picturing you, Joey Jackson, picturing you like, you know, like a baby, like a child. That's right. Absolutely. The reality is, is that where you're really going is the next questions out of your mouth are going to be, and here you are. Saying Help, that he wasn't. Him again. <laughs> see, what's that? Helping him again. And here yeah. you are saying he wasn't at the scene, saying he was somewhere else. You don't have any photographs. You don't have any. I get it. You know, exactly. So, all right. So I love that. And I can tell that you've done a lot of setting these sort of looking through cases. How do you prepare for a cross? How do you, um, Joey Jackson, kind of go through cross-examination, get ready for a, uh, a big cross-examination? Yeah, I think you really have to know your case, Neil. You have to know your theory. You have to know what you're going to argue. And that's not to suggest that things don't come up during the course of trial that are surprises. They always do. It's not to suggest that, you know, even after you review all the material, there's, you're kind of questioning, you know, what specific approach should I take? But I'm one that believes, you know, you, you have to at some point make a commitment to what story you're going to tell the jury. If you go and watch a movie right now, right? The movie is put together and the people who produce the movie know what the beginning, the middle and end is. They have to commit to a version. They have to commit to a strategy. They have to commit to the twists and the turns. And so when I look at a case, I'm, is it going to be self-defense? Is that what I'm going to argue? Then every cross-examination has to be predicated upon my client being in fear about the force being used proportionate to the threat posed, about my client acting reasonably. Is it gonna be that my client was not there? Then it has to be about, you know what? We know that identification is an issue. We know that it was dark and you know what? There are limitations. We know the area was crowded. So I think that any cross that you do has to be consistent with what your theory of the case is. And you have to get out from each witness something that really buttresses your theory of the case. And what I do, quite frankly, if I have, if a witness doesn't hurt me, I will get up and I will say, thank you for coming and sit right down. If a witness does nothing to further the, the theory of the prosecutor or to hurt me, thank you, see ya, and we keep it moving. If a witness does something that's adverse, then I have to neutralize it, right? If, it's, if it is identification, you said that you saw my client, is that right? That's what you indicated you did, is that right? But it was on the streets of New York City. We could agree with that. Correct. And it happens to be on 42nd Street, right? And 42nd Street, you know, to be an area that is pretty well traversed, right? And a lot of people are there, right? And this was during the during the day, correct? And during the day, you could agree with me that at six o'clock, it's rush hour, people are milling about. You'd agree with that. And there are buses that are going by and there are cars that are whizzing about and there are people riding bicycles. So I think everything and anything you do, you want to set the stage to go to your theory. And so what my cross is. You look at all the material, how's it going to support your theory, and you look at anything and everything that you could neutralize a witness with. Did they make a prior statement? Is that statement consistent? Is there something in their background that would give you pause as to their credibility? You know, everything and anything is fair play, and that's kind of how I approach the and case. And I love the visual imagery. I, I tell lawyers all the time. Yeah. If I say to you right now, I say, Joey, don't picture a shiny red New York City fire department, fire engine, fire truck with the big red, don't picture that big red shiny truck with that really polished chrome and the, the ladder and the Dalmatian in the front. Don't picture those guys coming down the shiny pole and hopping on that. Don't picture it. No one, the operative words are not don't or not. You can't help but draw the visual image. And so when you paint a visual image, one of the things that I think that 
you do in your cross-examinations that we're talking about very well is paint a visual image. And something else that I think you do really well is one of the things that I really admire you for is the way that you paint a visual image when you're talking about these cases and legal issues on television. Um, so I, I want to, I do want to ask you a little bit about that, but I have to ask you a, a couple. So I call this sort of my Gordo Cooper moment. Gordo Cooper was one of the guys in the right stuff. He was one of the Apollo astronauts. Um, I think uh, he was the guy at the end, um, was played by Dennis Quaid in that movie. And he's just about to go up in the air. And at one point they ask him, hey, Gordo, who's the best pilot you ever saw? And he starts, you know, <laughs> chomping at the bit. And he starts talking about, he's thinking of uh, Chuck Yeager. Well, there was this one guy out and his wife's looking at him like, there was this one guy in one of these, you know, Sandy test, you know, uh, uh, Air Force, um, what was it, uh, you know, test, whatever. Um, and, you know, dusty, you know, flight school and testing these rockets. There was a guy and they're all looking at him like, and he goes, <laughs> they ask it again. Who's the best? Who's the best cross? Who's the best pilot you ever saw? Because you're looking at him. So who was I? And I know everybody wants to say themselves and I get it and I can tell you're great at it. Mm -hmm. So. Before you say me, who's the best cross-examiner that you ever saw? I think the best cross-examiner I ever saw Hap, is, is uh, Tom Mesero. I think, think uh, he's fascinating with respect to the surgical precision in which he goes about. He goes about really just shredding a witness in terms of credibility, uh, in terms of telling a story, making the story compelling, having, uh, you know, it's one thing to cross people and you're me meandering all over the place. I think you have to have a structured cross where you, you have to get out. You have to tell the jury a story through your cross. And I think there's no one who's able to tell a better story. Uh, at the same time that I say that, I think in terms of courtroom presence, you know, I, I used to like the way Johnny Cochran really, uh, you know, went about his business. He was uh, not necessarily cross, but just in terms of overall courtroom presence, he was he was. Really? Oh, because he tension. I mean, when he rubbed his, so I know a lawyer like that here locally that I think he's got an incredible presence. But when 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 Johnny Cochran was sitting there and he rubbed his rubbed his mustache, we were all looking at it. When he you know took off his glasses for a moment, we were looking at it. He just has that yes that that, that presence. Amazing. Um, all right, let me ask you. Um, uh, so, have you gone in front of? any difficult judges you know the judges that don't let you do your thing that get in your grill yes and if so i don't want to know the names uh but more about how do you deal with those difficult judges tell me a story and how you deal with them. so yeah one judge in particular we have a case actually pending in the uh in federal court now uh it, it's been going back and forth like a ping pong i had a client and i uh, my he shot someone and kill them. And my theory was self-defense and the judge would not give me a self-defense instruction. And <laughs> I had to argue a case without, I had to argue self-defense without arguing self-defense because the judge said I couldn't argue it. And so we went to the appellate division after my client was convicted. The appellate division let my guy out on bail pending appeal. <clears throat> uh, subsequent to that, the appellate division, first department reversed his conviction. And then we went to the Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in New York State, and they reversed the appellate division. And then we took it to the federal court where it's pending on a writ of habeas corpus. <clears throat> and that judge was just impossible. Uh, I mean, not to give me a self-defense instruction when it's the standard is, is there any reasonable view of the evidence seen in the light most favorable to the defendant? Like, that's such an easy standard. And he wouldn't give it to me. And so I, I was really hamstrung in terms of what I can argue, but he was very difficult. But I think, and I say to, to young lawyers, and, and not only difficult then, but just in, in the whole, you know, speed it up, you're trying to minimize and diminish me every way that he could. But I think you gotta stick with your game and you have to be like, yes, judge, my apologies, your honor. Let's moving forward, you know? And every way a judge tries to minimize, to minimize, you know, vote for the other side to do whatever they have to do kill them with kindness, maintain your professionalism, make your arguments to the jury, and, and you'll find, right, 80% of the time, maybe more, the jurors afterwards will be like, what, what was the judge's problem? Like, what happened? You know, we had your back, I didn't understand. So I just say, try your case, don't let anyone ruffle your feathers. 
I was in federal court on a case, um, you know, where we had uh, so, some, you know, re really good luck with respect to the outcome. And this judge, again, the hardest of times. Yes, Your Honor. Of course, Your Honor. Finish up your finish up your closing argument, Mr. Jackson. Yes, of course, Judge. I have only have a few moments. Thank you. You just you just got to be you. You got to keep your cool, you, and you just have to try your case and maintain your comportment and demeanor in front of that jury at all times. And everything. In a longer trial. It's um, you. You're right. The jurors. Yeah. <laughs> Every day you come home and you're like, you know, you're you're licking your wounds. You're looking over and you're hoping the jury's kind of. Like, I don't deserve this treatment, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. All right. So last couple of areas that I want to, this is mm -hmm. one of my favorite questions to ask. Um, if you could cross-examine one person in history, <laughs> who would it be and why? Uh, <laughs> I think if I had to cross-examine one person in history, I think, it, does it only have to be one no, you can pick. We'll we'll give you two. I wanna. I would want to cross examine Scott Peterson, and I wanna would want to cross examine O.J. Simpson. Okay, Those so Scott people. Peterson, why? Uh, I think I would want to know with respect to the story that he told with regard to going on TV and saying, "Where's my wife?" and "Where's my unborn, you know, unborn child?" and then the uh, lake and the else. fishing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I want answers to those questions. Like, what were you thinking? Not that either testified, but you didn't limit it to those who did, didn't testify. And OJ Simpson, yeah. as, as far as like, you know, put him on the stand and tell your story and let me cross-examine you with regard to everything that you did that was seemingly inconsistent from your position. But I guess those would be the two people that I would love to have at it with. <laughs> Fantastic. So I, I wanted to... Um, I'd like to ask, I mean, obviously we kind of know what's on deck for you. I've taken up a lot of your time, which I greatly appreciate. So let's start with, first of all, um, if you could tell us how you got into the legal commentary, you know, with, uh, and commented on these, uh, these important cases, I do want to give you real props for one second, real credit. Um, I heard you describe and talk about inferences, uh, in talking about, Gabby Petito and the La Brian Laundry and his family, and I thought it was a really um, well. I thought it was a, it was a well taken explanation for why people draw conclusions from omissions and actions, and why it's fair for people to draw reasonable inferences from when a person doesn't do something that you would expect them to do, and when they do something that you um, would expect them to do, have done differently. Um, I thought it was a great explanation. And so um, tell me if you would, how'd you get into legal commentary? And then I, I like to sort of end the whole, you know, our, our discussion. If you tell me what's on deck for you, how do people reach you? Are you going to be speaking anywhere? Where can they find you if they have questions or they have cases that they want to consult with you about? Sure. Thank you, Neil. So uh, in, in brief, the legal commentary career was a complete accident. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned OJ it was interesting because I had done a website uh, years ago, uh, 2005, six, whatever it was. And in that website, you know, I put up defense attorney extraordinaire, blah, 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 you know, all the great things we say about ourselves. And I got a call because uh, it happened to be Fox News. Fox News was doing research and they said, hey, we came across your website. Would you be interested in coming in and talking about this case? It happened to be the OJ case. And I didn't know back then um, it was OJ2, meaning the Heisman Trophy issue. Um, you know, it was that case that he was found guilty of when he stole his own Heisman Trophy, not OJ1. We know what happened in OJ1. Um, so they had gone through that and they said, and I didn't know what they were asking me. I said, well, I don't know OJ and I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not one of his lawyers. They said, no, no, we understand. And I was like, well, why are you asking me? Like I was talking myself out of it because I had no idea what they were talking about. But fortunately, the woman was so patient and so kind and so understanding. She said, no, I understand that. You know, we just do these panels where we have lawyers who are not connected to the case and they give their point of view. And usually we like to offer the audience kind of different perspectives. And we just want to know if you want to come in one day and maybe you can give some analysis. So I started doing that and I loved it. I was like, wow, this is really cool. And then I just, you know, one day working there and, and I wasn't paid or anything else. I was just a volunteer coming, <clears throat> you know, led to another day and another call and another show and another network. 
And I like to tell people who want to do media commentary and, you know, think that, you know, if they don't get the job tomorrow, they never will. I say, just, you know, relax, you, you can, and you will, if you follow through. And I really worked for Fox for five years for free as just a person who, when they called me, I came and did analysis until I finally got a call um, from Court TV at the time. And they said, hey, look, we've been following your work. Can you come in? And I was offered a contract with Court TV that was in session, which is in the Turner family. And then I got a contract with Headline News and then CNN, and they're all interrelated. And it just snowballed, but I wasn't planning to do it. I wasn't just like when I, you know, I wasn't born to do it. I didn't ever envision doing it. It's just something that happened. And I'll end with this, Neil, and that is they always say that success comes when preparation meets with opportunity. And so in the event you're prepared and you get the call and you get the opportunity, what are you going to do with it? And so, you know, just by a fortunate uh, confluence of circumstances, that's what happened. And so I've been uh, with CNN, I guess, since 2000, uh, 2013. Uh, you know, I've been a contributor with CNN, HLN, and in that in that whole network, and they've been just tremendous uh, with the opportunities, and they allow me to do what they you know allow me to do, and I'm grateful. Um, and so, what's going on next is we have this Ahmad Arbery trial that's coming up uh, in Georgia, and we'll be covering that as a network uh, very closely. And I'll be doing a lot of legal commentary there, and just trying to you know balance that to the extent I can. Uh, you know, with my practice and with everything else uh, that we're doing. So that's, that's and if people want to find you on, let's just work through social media, if they want to find you or they have questions for you. Sure. Um, and I, and believe it or not, I've had people that have emailed me and said, um, Hey, I, I want to reach out to Lisa Bloom. So, okay. Um, I always like to, to have them have an opportunity as they're listening to think if I want to talk to Joy Jackson, or I want to talk to someone in his office, where would they do that? Uh, Lisa Bloom, a uh, great human being, know her well. She's fantastic. Hi, Lisa, keep doing your great job. Uh, Gloria Alrod, know her too. All right, so, excuse me, her mom, great work she does. Uh, but yeah, uh, so they can just, if you type in Joey Jackson, uh, you'll find me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all of that stuff. You'll find my firm, my, my website, just by typing in my name. I am not the football player who's 70 something years old. Um, <laughs> you know, so I, it, mind you, Neil, here's how this works. If the football player was like 32 and, and the Incredible Hulk, I'd be like, yeah, that's me. But everybody's like, hey, you're that 70 something year old football player. I'm like, wait, that's so fair. Um, but there's a football player that I share a name with. And apparently sometimes I get crossed, you know, um, mixed up with him. But if you just type in my name, you'll find me. And it's always, you know, good to hear from people and people could be very gracious and kind. Sometimes, you know, maybe not so much, but I find on balance that people could be uh, very solid. Um, and uh, on that note, uh, you're about as solid as they come. And I'm just grateful that you uh, took the time to speak with me this afternoon. Oh, thank you. I really, really appreciate that. Joey Jackson, I know I could probably talk to you for another two hours, but um, we each have things to do. And I wanted to have the chance to talk to you and to hear you and for people to hear you in this setting. And I'm so grateful that you chose to talk to me on uh, the Killer Cross-Examination podcast. So thank you so much. It is my honor and privilege. Keep doing what you do. You do it very well. And, you know, you serve a, a needed purpose. And so um, uh, hallelujah, amen, and God bless you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs>